Amen. Amen. <coughs> my name's Craig and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Craig. Hey. Um, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's about four years that I've been clean and sober. And part of the promises is that, you know, fear and economic insecurity leave us. Economic insecurity, I agree with fear, no. I still shit myself sitting here trying to share in front of people. And that, and that just goes to show that, you know, we don't really fully recover. We will always be alcoholic in every way of our lives. Fear being the biggest part for me, um, that's I think was my biggest downfall when coming into recovery, was fear in it. And you know, I've been listening to shares and about people's fears and about clean time and various things in the last two weeks. And then, trying to, you know, do the perfect share today. But, you know, at the end of the day, I can only share my story. And what really struck me with one of the shares is they were talking about clean time. And and I hear people turning around and I'm like 10 years clean and I'm five years clean, I'm two years clean, I'm one years clean. That's off alcohol, that's off substance. But really, are you clean? Um, I look at it. I don't believe that I'm four years clean because I'm only as clean as the last, uh, the last bad thing I did. And that to me is regular. That's life on life's terms for me. I mean, um, I look at my work, working environment I currently work in, it's, it's, it's very demanding in that, and I can, I can swear a lot. I can be very judgmental towards people. That's addict behavior, that's me an actor. So really, am I four years clean? And that is a reminder for me, that's why every day I know I'm not gonna get it right. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be the perfect person in recovery. I'm not gonna do the right things all the time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to practice this program to the best of my ability. And that's, that's the gift that I've been given from my higher power, was understanding that I have to practice this program to the best of my ability. <coughs> if I go back to inactive, um, you know, I, like everybody here, I had a normal upbringing. I had a mom and dad that really cared for me and loved me and cherished me. And, I mean, they were my biggest enablers at the end of the day. Um, I had brothers that were really caring people and, and a lot different to me. And that played true in my head because like, at a very young age, I was like, I'm adopted. I'm seriously adopted into this family. I don't look like my mom. My mom's very short, so okay, maybe there, but my dad's six foot eight, my brothers are six foot eight. They've all got brown eyes, I've got blue eyes. So that's it, it's done. And that's addict thinking. That's how we think all the time. It's like, just because there's one difference, I'm not that person, I'm not the same as, I am different. And I lived my life like that. I lived my life in every aspect. Um, people did something in a specific way. I had to do it differently. I had to be that person that, you know, if everybody's going left to the mall, I'm turning right. I'm going to do it differently because I know better. And to me, that was my biggest downfall as well, was the fact that I thought I knew better. I mean, I was speaking to uh, members of this fellowship um, yesterday and expressing how nervous I am and I don't know what to share about and things like that and you know, we part of being in recovery is that you never see your growth you never see how far you've come and I speak to members just to see and gauge where I am and the one thing that stood out for me was that I arrived into recovery and know it all I knew everything I had this I can do this and I you know it's I sit back and no, nah, I wasn't like that. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't, but really, actually, I was. I mean, I had an answer for absolutely everything. I remember one of the counselors turning around. I was in a concerned group, and she looked at me and she said, Fuck, you need to be a politician because you've got an answer for everything. And today, you know, I understand that, I'm, and, and I don't have an answer for everything. I don't know why I'm sober. I don't know why I am still living a clean life today, I don't know. All I know is, is that what those steps have given me, I keep practicing and somewhere along there, there's magic happening and that magic is keeping me sober. And I think that magic is, to me, my higher power. That's exactly where it is because what I've done in the last four years of my life is I've taken the hands off the steering wheel and stepped back into the back seat of the vehicle and my, let my higher power do what he needs to do. And there are times where I don't agree with him. I don't agree with how he's running my life. And it's a bit of pull to swallow because, you know, I am that type of addict where you can take 
my work, that's fine. You can look after my work environment, that's cool, because you're doing a good job there. My money that day, you're doing a sturdy job, take that as well. You're doing an absolutely magnificent job. My friendships and that, uh, okay, these friends you can look at, those don't, no, because they're faulty. I don't want you to look after those that, and then, oh, by the way, relationships with women, nah, it's my course, not yours, but that's mine. I'll look after that. And I've just recently got a massive hiding um, in that whole department because I haven't just let God in that. I've gone and run that avenue myself. I've literally got stepped in front of that bus, I'm not in front of the bus, but into the driver's seat of that bus. And I've driven <coughs> that, that, that vehicle. And <clears throat> uh, somebody that was pestering me, I blocked and said, look, I don't want to talk to you. Now, this is the irony of it. When I was in treatment, I had a, a relationship in, in, in the facility and my sponsor at the time was Caleb and this girl and I were like, we were swinging hard and enjoying life inside the facility and I decided, you know what, um, I'm going to put myself on a woman ban. I'm not going to talk to this girl, I'm going to have nothing to do with her because I know that's the right thing to do. I'm not going to discuss this thing with her, I'm not going to do anything and that's what I'm going to do. Caleb wasn't there, Caleb was away on, I think, on leave. So I'm going to do that because Caleb's not there. That was my justification. Considering that Josh was there, Stelio was there, Keith was there, I could have gone to any of them and, and told them what happened. And it got to a point where I owned my stuff and said, listen, this is what's happened. And I got a concern after concern after concern because of it for that. And I still couldn't see my part. I literally stood there and blamed everybody. It's like, I did the right thing. I put myself on a woman bed. I went and I, I owned this. But how I owned this was, I'm in love with her. She's amazing. She's the best thing since last cheese. And I'm going to come in clean and show you that I love her because I'm coming clean. That's how much I love her. How sick am I? <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I'm finding love in the rehab. Uh, you know? <laughs> but at that moment, it's, I'm sick as I can be. And after all of that that had happened, it's like, you know, I sat down in the, I sat down and I, I went through the whole thing with Caleb at the time and that and he turned around and said, Do you know where your biggest mistake was? And I was like, No. He said, You never came and spoke to me. You never came and said, This is what I this is what is might be happening or could be happening. I would have dealt with it and you would have got out of this thing a hell of a lot better than what you currently are. And that's, that's run through my life. I keep using that as a gauge for me because every time shit goes south in my life and I don't reach out and I don't talk to people, I get a hiding. And that's what's happened now. I mean, I've tried to run this whole thing by myself, haven't spoke to my sponsor honestly about what's happening and, 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 and wow, it came for me. I got a package in the post the other day with five and a half thousand ends with the gifts in it from a girl. And I'm like, I, 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 I don't know what to do. And this is how this program has changed me, and it's because I can see it now. Inactive, whoopee, as an expensive aftershave, like these shirts, biltong, and da 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 da, lacquer. First thing I'll be wearing today is that with that expensive aftershave. I'm wearing Brute and a second hand t shirt today. Because I can see that this is not right. This is fucking, insane. I am so uncomfortable in my skin right now because of this. I have been speaking to my friends. I've been really, I've gone for advice. I know what to do. Monday, parcel closed, wrapped up, back it goes. With a letter saying, fuck off and leave me alone. Because the first time I was nice about it, I did say to her, please, I'm blocking you. This is the reason I'm blocking you. What you want, I can't give you. I don't want a relationship with you. Friendship, that's it. Let's leave it at that. It doesn't want, it was, and it's, it's strange how I'm sitting here and <clears throat> People have pointed out to me about my behavior, which I can't see about how I might have led this person on. And it took a woman in this fellowship to point that out to me. Now, I've acted on that. I've actually addressed that. I've sat down and looked at it and said to myself, maybe I am. What is it that I'm doing that is leading this person on? And I've now had to change that behavior. And that's the beauty of the program. That's what this program has given me, is the ability to see that now and to change those behaviors. And <clears throat> like I said to you, so am I for you is clean. That's, that's where I've, I know there, that is exactly how I would have acted. That's how I've been acting in, in, in recovery, is exactly how I acted when I was in act. 
inactive. That's how I treated people. I, I led them on. I misled them into believing things that aren't true. And I look back and say, did I say anything? But I can't see it because I'm in it. I can't see the things that I've done 100% because as an addict, I always justify where I am in my mistakes. I crossed that robot because the guy didn't stop quick enough behind me, so I jumped the robot. No, 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 I should have stopped at the robot irrespective. The law says so. The same as what is happening in my life at the moment with this person. It's like, there are certain things I have done which I am justifying because I was nice to her because she was going through a tough time. She was going through a divorce and I'm trying to help her. And like, I, I'm thinking I'm helping her, but actually I'm, I'm leading her on because I'm showing her that I care for her in a way deeper than what a friend would, and, 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 and I'm trying to be a friend. It's not okay, it's really not okay. And I can see that now because somebody pointed that out to me. In active, you pointed that out to me, it's like, you don't know what you're talking about. Or, I'm in love with her and I'm coming clean and telling you all about it, guys. So really, I, am I that bad? No, yes I am, I'm an absolute dick. I'm an absolute dick because I've taken this woman and I've really ruined her life. Exactly what I've done. And I've done that in being clean and so So, I am at times a nice guy and a lot of the times I'm an absolute arsehole. And the beautiful thing about what recovery has given me is that I like this arsehole. I like it. I do like Craig. I am proud of the person I have become because I make mistakes. I'm not afraid to come real and say I've made a mistake, guys. I'm here to own it and I want to say, help me. And when I do that, it's strange how that miracle happens in my life again. Because at that point in time, when that person or people come to me and they give me the advice, as much as I don't like it, I find relief in it. I do find relief. It's like that problem has been lifted from my life. I can now breathe again. I can now focus again on things that I need to do in my life, like working like a proper human being, not being aggressive at work, not bullying people, not sitting and, and, and bad-mouthing people and being judgmental and, and, and. Those are the normal things that I need to be working on, but I've taken all my attention, I'll be working on something that has really taken a lot out of me. And instead of handing it over, I'd like to keep it to myself, you know. I probably, you can't touch us on my side that I need to look, out of, of, look after. And, you know, I look at it, part of the, part of the, our, our 12 steps is that we have to hand over, we have to practice all these principles in all our affairs, not just specific points of our affairs, but all our affairs. You know, I look at it and, and, and say that, to me, I'm grateful and I'm thankful for this hiding that I received. Because it is, for me, as an eye-opener as to how quickly I can have a behavioural relapse. I can go back into that old ways of doing things. And it's times like that that I'm grateful that my higher power comes and screams and shouts and swears and beats me back to where I need to be. Because that's what's happened. I mean, all of us sit here and I'm sure we've all, in your recovery, done things that you're not happy about and very uncomfortable. That pain that you feel inside, that emptiness, that broody, that hole, like, I'm uncomfortable. I'd rather take a beating with a stick than carry this. Because it is, it's, it's the most, it's horrible, but it's beautiful. Because I never had this before. I never, ever had this before. I would have taken those gifts, I would have been wearing them today, I would have led her on because, in all fairness, this is how sick my head is. I can use it for everything she's got. I can have sex whenever I want. I can make her buy a house for me if she's rich enough. I can be looked after till the end of time. And that's how sick my head goes. I'm an addict, that's how we think. But today I don't do that. Today it's like, that parcel arrived, I opened it, I was like, this is a lot of money and this woman spent it on me and I haven't, and I'm being honest with you, I haven't even kissed her. How okay is this? It's not okay. I, I mean, no, how can somebody spend that amount of money on a person that don't know them? It's not okay. And I'm part of that. And I can see that, that I am part of that. I made that happen. So today, four years in recovery has given me that gift that I can see that. I look back over my four years and I can break my years down. One year, year one, two, three, and four. Year one for me was my fun year. That was the year where I actually followed every suggestion that my sponsor and the 
people at the House on the Hill gave me, and that was have fun in your first year. Forget about trying to find a job. Forget about trying to heal relationships. Have fun. Go out, become friends with the people that are in fellowship around you because they're not going to be there all the time. I'm four years. It's myself, Mitchell, and Ross. It's the only few people I know in my group that are still sober today. And my group was as big as this that you're sitting here. And for that first year, that's exactly what I did. I listened and I went and I had fun. I enjoyed my recovery. I made recovery fun for me. I did the things that they say that you need to do. Go out and fellowship. Go and have parties with your mates. Go and sit down and drink coffee. Spend 25 to 30 minutes after the meeting talking and socializing with the people that are at the meeting. Make it fun and enjoyable. Go to conventions. Do those type of things. And I did. I did everything like that in my first year. And it's funny how that trickled over into my second year because my second year was all about making amends to everybody that I damaged and hurt in my life. And that's what I set out to do. And that's what I did. I went out to, took that list, I worked through it with Caleb, and I set out and I made amends to them. Some of those amends were fairly easy, like mom and dad, because you know, they forgive you, it doesn't matter what you do. The difficult amends were amends that I'm still making today, and that's to my children, because I destroyed two little boys' lives. I can see that today clearly, because I don't have my sons around me anymore, they're in England. And I took away something that my dad gave me as, as a youngster, and that was fun and enjoyable home. I had fun. I played rugby with my father. I played golf with my father. I taught, was taught how to play golf with my father. What did I teach my sons to do? I taught them how to scale and drink. I used to take my sons, put them in a car, go to a bottle store, buy a bottle, and then I used to buy them Cokes. And then I used to take them to the park to play and pass out in a car. That's what I did to my children. I can see that today. It's a, it's, it is. It's a horrible and difficult pill to swallow, but I swallow it every day. God was cruel but kind to me because he took those boys away from me. He was kind in doing that because I would have raised two monsters if I carried on doing what I was doing and how I was doing it. And he put them in a place where I can see today they're better. He was kind to me in that respect because he didn't take them and put them in another person's house that was going to beat them or hurt them. He took them and put them in England with a mother that cares and is compassionate and is loving towards them. Today I sleep easy because my son's in a better place in this country. They're well looked after and they've got a mother that really cares deeply for them and can give them the love that they deserve. And that to me is my second year. That's what I had to go through in my second year. I had to, I had to make those amends. I had to sit down and go to my ex-partner and <coughs> sit and listen to this man open his heart up to me and blame himself for where I am. And then turn around and tell him it's not his fault, that that journey was set from the day I was born. That wasn't going to change. I was born an addict. I know that. It's in my behavior. It's in who I am. And that second year was fixing those relationships with people and start building relationships with my family and with my friends. My third year was about securing myself financially and looking out at my family and making sure that I am changing the picture. And that happened a month ago with my mom's 70th birthday when we sat down there and I'm sure quite a few people in this room can attest to a month prior to my family coming to you, I was, fuck, I was grumpy. I was moody, I was insane, I was off the chart, I was shitting myself. And once again, promise of fear leaving, it doesn't leave, it's there. I never, that fear never left me. I shat myself. My mom and dad and my brothers are coming up. It's the first time in, in recovery that I've been in the same house with my whole family. I've never, I've always been with my mom and dad or I've been with my brothers. I've never had them together as a family. And now was the opportunity. And I was scared. I was shitting myself because how am I going to act? They used to see Craig bully, aggressive, violent, sleeping, um, high as a kite. That's who they used to see. And... <clears throat> I made it all about myself leading up to my mom and dad to the point where I was I was a jack in the box. I don't know what to do with myself eventually. And <clears throat> I sat and I spoke to my sponsor and to friends and the suggestion was, why don't you just change the picture? That's how easy it was. But my mind don't see that. 
I don't see that connection. I just, it's me, I see me. I'm, how I'm going to be affected, how I'm going to be hurt. And how I, what am I going to do? And it's no, it's not what am I going to do. It's what are we going to do? Listen to what we say to you. And the family and friends around me said to me, just go and make it about them. Go and make it about them. And I spent a week with my family and that's what I did. I spent a week making it about my mother and father and about my brothers and doing whatever my mom and dad wanted to do, not what I wanted to do, what my mom and dad and my brothers wanted to do. And when my brother, who I don't see eye to eye still today, when he was doing things that were aggravating me where I would react and everybody knew, I mean, my dad on a couple of occasions looked at me knowing because this is where John and Craig are going to fight now. I did. I just looked at my brother, walked away, and carried on playing with the kids and enjoying myself. And everybody left and went home. And two days later, I got a phone call from my father. Now, normally I get that phone call every single family function, every single do we have. There will be a phone call two days later to say, why did you do that again? Why did you make it about yourself? Can't you just go there and behave? Wah, 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 wah. Bitch in mind, bitch in mind. That's all I had. This time around was, that's my boy. This is the person I've been looking for. And cocaine can give you a high, but that high, I've lived it tenfold. I still today cry about it. I still today share about it. I still today live it because that high never leaves me. It's in me. It's, yeah, it's part of me now. It will be till the day I die. It's a memory that I carry. And it's a memory I made in recovery. And I've changed the picture for my mom and dad. I've made them see the sun for who their son really is. And that to me is what my third year brought me, was being able to change the picture and see it happening in front of me. I look at the relationships I've built in this room here with people, Joe, Steve, Yvonne, of course you're sexy, Neville. <laughs> <laughs> and various others. I've built relationships that I trust these people with my life. I have, I mean, and it's, they, they, there's a saying that says, men help him, men and women help women. That's true. Until you make friends with those people. I've got, a, I've got amazing friends in Yvonne, and I've got amazing friends in Wendy. They're my two best friends. And I could, if I had to look in active, could I honestly say I'd ever have two best friends as females? No, no. Your role in my life was someone warm next to me at night, someone to cook my food, look after my children. That's where you fit in my life. Today you don't, you fit in every avenue of my life. You're now my best friend. You're now somebody I can trust with, with, with things in my life. That's the role that those people have taken in my life. Neville is, I met Neville in treatment facility as the crazy chef and my best friend. He's not just my best friend, he's my sponsor. I share so much likeliness to Neville that he'll look at me and go, you're not okay. And then hammer me with a cock that I don't want to hear. And you know, and the beautiful thing is that that relationship is reciprocated both ways. I look at him, he's my sponsor, but I, I can see he's hurting and I put my arms around him and I talk to him and I give him advice from my side. I look at the trouble he's been through, I've been through it. This is where this program works because my shit that I went through in active is helping my sponsor, my best friend, today. And that's where this program works. That's why I don't mind coming here and sharing about real shit in my life. Like, I fuck up constantly. I make mistakes. I swear at my staff. I can't be abusive. I've picked up a spade and nearly hit one. I've done those things because that's life. I'm not perfect. I'm not, a, I'm not a saint. I'm going to do those things. And I'm going to do it again tomorrow. I know that. But I'm okay with that because I know... I have a choice. When that moment arrives, I can either pick up the spade and follow through and beat him, or I can put the spade down. I put the spade down. I didn't beat the guy. I put it down, but I did pick the spade up. At the end of the day, I owned it. And I came clean. I went to my boss. I spoke to my boss about it. They laughed at me about it. But it was funny for them, but I felt cuck. Because I know that's not okay. That's not who I want to be. It's not what I want to be. I don't want to be that person. I like the person I am today. I like the fact that I have a relationship with every single person in this room. I like the fact that there are people in this room that come to me when they're going through a difficult time and ask me for advice. If 
five years ago, you wouldn't ask me for objection, not even a pen. Because if you put your hand out, I'd steal your watch off it. That was crazy. That today is not the same guy. Today I can sit down, I can laugh with people, I can enjoy my life for what it is. And that was my third year. My fourth year was realizing that recovery is beautiful for me. And recovery is, it's become a passion, something that I really enjoy. I really love it. It's, it's amazing because it's given me three gifts in my life. It's given me year one, year two, and year three. I've experienced the gifts that I've chosen I want to experience. I've lived my life. I've had difficult things happen in year four for me. And I've dealt with them. I've dealt with the fact that my children had to go overseas. And I was in the rehab at the time that happened. I don't think I would have got through that if it wasn't for Neville, if it wasn't for Stelio, and if it wasn't for Caleb. Three addicts that helped me. Not my father, not my mother, not a psychologist, not a psychiatrist. Three addicts helped me. And three addicts carried me through and put me up the other side. I share my, my youth with people like Steve. We have got an amazing taste in music and we love listening to those things and sharing it amongst each other and talking about those types of things. And, that, and what would I do in active with somebody like I'd be using with you? I'd be making my name totty with you. <laughs> but today, I'm not. Today we share about what we want to do and go fishing and this and that. And that's changed. I mean, recovery is so much fun. It is so much fun. And it is exactly like at the end of the thing, you know, you've got to work it. If you want to make it, you've got to, you've got to give. And that's what I've done. I've made my recovery fun. I've made my recovery a fun place to be. People know, and a lot of people have come to my house and I bry on the weekends, they bry and they enjoy themselves, and they, come, and they come back. They come back, not because they want to ask me to return their watch or their wallet. They come back because I cook great, I'm a great person to be around, and I'm fun. But I chose to make it that. I chose to keep my recovery fun. I want to keep it fun. I've listened to shares where they talk about a five-year menopause. How many years are you clean? <laughs> Almost but, 12. Yeah. <laughs> but they speak about a five-year menopause. I don't want to go through a five-year menopause. I want to make my recovery fun. I want to enjoy my recovery. I've done things this year, and I've made a, a conscious decision to do things that I haven't done in active and through the year. I've started fishing. I've started kayaking. I've started surfing. I've started shooting. And I've done that in the last year of my life. Recovery has become fun for me. Recovery has become a full life again. I look at my weeks, I'm busy at work, I've got friends that I go and see. I sit and I, I go to meetings in the evenings. My weekends are gone, I don't have them. I literally wake up on a Friday and go to bed on a Sunday. I used to do that in active, but I never slept. Now I sleep, but it feels like I wake up Friday, go to bed on Sunday. That's how full my life has become. I spend time with people in the fellowship. I sit with Dino at his shop, having coffee with a man, talking to him and laughing, discussing <coughs> people that are struggling on the street and how we can contribute and help these people. In active, I'm sitting there talking about, just you've got a cute ass, hey? and look at that, okay, that nice watch, I think we can remove that for a gram. But now that, now that, that talk is no longer, that talk is about, shame the Oaks struggling, hey? let's see how we can help him. Meeting members of this room here, and seeing them struggle and knowing that I could be the key to unlock that pain for them and help them out of that pain, that's a gift that I don't think anybody wants to miss because the, the joy, the happiness, when you see the look on that person's face when that relief leaves them, when you know that you've been key to it, only recovery gives you that. And only an addict will give you that because psychologists never gave me that, psychiatrists never gave me that, addicts gave me that. They taught me how to love again. They taught me how to, to live again and live addict style. And I like it. I enjoy being able to wake up every morning knowing that I only have 24 hours to make the best of what I can. Back in active, wake up and it's like, I've got to apologize for all the cock I did last night. And then I've got to now plan how I'm going to return the money that I took. And, and, and. so I'm constantly living in the past and 
future, the past and the future, the past and the future. I'm suffering with anxiety, I wonder why. I'm suffering with pain in my life and I wonder why. I don't understand why everybody hates me. I've done nothing wrong. I've been trying to get the money back to you. But if I never took the money in the first place, I don't have to get it back to you. I don't have to go and live like that. Today I don't live like that. Today it's like I wake up in the morning, it's like, who am I going to fuck with today? And it's like, I enjoy it. I get up and I rag my roommate and I give him shit. And I pick up the phone and I phone and I bitch him on at Devon and I phone my favorite oak in the world at five o'clock in the morning and hear him whining and his wife whining at me. Those are things I do and I enjoy it. I love it because I affect them and they're laughing and they're joyful and they're happy. And that's, that's who I am and that's who I want to be and that's who I want to carry on being. I choose my recovery because I like my recovery. I love my recovery. Recovery has given me a second world of life. And most of all, recovery has given me one thing that I've always wanted in my life. A place to belong and friends. And I've got it today. I'm driving, I've walked from my house today with my hand in hand with my best friend Yvonne. And this up next to me tries and picks me up like I'm a cheap hooker on the side of the road. Eh? Now that's at it, yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, that's, who would stop to come and say hello to me in the past? Nobody. People avoided me. Got to come in people stopping next to me saying, hello, how are you doing? That never happened. That is happening now to me. That's what recovery has given me. That's what four years in recovery has given me. It's given me the ability to change my life and show people that my life has changed. That's what recovery has given me. And it's not difficult. It's not difficult. If you can live according to your 12 steps, and it's 12 simple steps, you could break it down even further. Step one. I don't want to be a god anymore. I don't know. I make cuck, I make cuck. There it is. Step two. Okay, that's me making the cuck. Step three. God help me, because I don't know how. If I follow those first three steps, 90% of my problems are okay. And now I'm an arsehole, so now I'm going to go and speak to people and tell them what an arsehole I am, and I'm sorry that I was an arsehole too then. And I do that. It's cuck in the beginning, but you do get used to it. That I promise you, because I do it often. And you get used to it. And it's nice when you change that picture for those people. When you say, I'm not going to come and hit on your wife again. It's nice to change a picture. You can go to that person's house and the wife feels comfortable and the husband feels comfortable around you. Because that's who I was. I'm not that person anymore. Because I've used the steps to change that picture. And I've realized that if I change the picture, I need to continue changing that picture. And to continue changing the picture means I have to admit that I'm not going to do the things again. I have to admit that I'm powerless over everything that I do in my life. And I have to admit that when I'm wrong, I can change that picture. And I just do that all over again and over again every day of my life. That's all I do. And it's, that's how simple recovery has come for me. I believe I've got a higher power. I've got to make a mistake, change the picture, and then just do that over again. That's all I do. And they say, if you made it through sober yesterday, do what you did yesterday and you'll get through sober today. That's the truth. So that's what I do. I just ch keep changing that picture. It's as simple as that. Just change the picture. Make sure I don't do it again. And if I do it, do it again, then I've got to go really look at myself as to why am I doing it again. Maybe there's an underlying problem. Maybe there's something that I haven't addressed. And address it. Sit down with your sponsor. Talk through it. Get it resolved and move on. Don't sit and dwell in the past about it and then, no, oh, what am I going to do in that? No, man, it's a mistake. You're human. You've got to make them move on. Get on to the next problem. Solve that problem. Get to the next one. Solve that one. And that's how, that's what recovery has given me, the ability to do that. And I enjoy doing that. I enjoy sitting down with people around me and listening to their problems and then trying to help them find a solution. First thing it does, it takes me straight out of self. I'm not selfless, I'm not thinking about me, I'm thinking about somebody else. And I surround myself with people like that all the time. I'm constantly at a friend's house, speaking to my sponsor, speaking to, although it's five o'clock in the morning, but speaking to people around me and picking up the phone and phoning Yvonne and Wendy. And I do that every day, all day. Because I'm enjoying my recovery. I like to hear what, what's going on for my friend next door to me. I like to hear what's going on for Steve in his life. Why is he not going fishing with me? Why is he not doing that? And then listening to that and then putting a, putting a solution in place and going and doing it. That's what recovery has given me. And that's what I love about it. And today I can sit here and say, four years clean, I'm four years clean of drugs and alcohol. But I'm only 24 hours sober. 
I'm only 24 hours sober because I act out every single day. So I'm only as sober as the last session, bad, bad act out session I had. And that's daily. So I love my program in the sense that I have 24 hours in which to enjoy my life and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to live the next 24 hours the same as I did yesterday. And I promise you, the last four years have been fun for me. They have been great fun. I've enjoyed every single moment of it. And I just want to say thanks to everybody in this room for making an effort to be part of my life. Because without the people in this room, I don't think I would have recovery as easy as what I've had today. Thanks for sharing. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.